My name is Dan Murphy. I'm an assistant editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker tonight, Dr. Paul E. Hoffman. Um, Dr. Hoffman sent me a CV uh, in preparation for the introduction, and I've uh, boiled it down to three pages, even though it was probably about 20 pages long. And uh, for those of you that have never done this, uh, uh, introducing someone is very, very difficult. Um, someone stature of Dr. Hoffman because um, he has amazing accomplishments uh, in a variety of different areas, and picking and choosing is really, really difficult. So I did the best I could, um, but know that there's a lot more to this standpoint. Long before Paul Hoffman became Paul W. and Nancy W. Merle, distinguished professor of history at Louisiana State University, he made an enduring impact in how we understand early Florida history. Paul received his PhD from the University of Florida in 1969. But by that point, he was already producing scholarly treatments of the region. One of his first efforts was an article in the Florida Historical Quarterly titled, The Narrow Water Strategies of Pedro Menendez, published in 1966. Dozens of other articles and book chapters appeared over the ensuing years, along with more than 100 book reviews. Paul's monographs have largely set the standard for how historians now interpret southeastern North America in general, Florida specifically. His first book, The Spanish Crown and the Defense of the Caribbean, 1535-1585, Precedent Patrimonialism and the Royal Parsimony, um, examined Spain's administration of the Caribbean colonies during the mid-16th century with a critical but nuanced interpretive lens. His third book, A New Andalusia and a Way to the Orient, the American Southeast during the 16th century, which was first published in 1990, not only earned an award from Spain's Ministry of Culture, but also received the prestigious Francis Parkman Award from the Society of American Historians. Over two, two decades old now, the New Andalusia remains one of the best assessments of Spain's role in southeastern North America and is still used by teachers of Florida history today, including on this campus, actually. Equally influential is Hoffman's latest monograph, Florida's Frontiers, published in 2002. A monumental undertaking, this work covers Florida's history from its pre-contact period to its incorporation by the United States, and the process deciphering most aspects of colonial life under Spanish and British rule, while emphasizing the vital role of Native Americans, the vital role of Native Americans played in resisting and surviving conquest. In scope and style, Florida's frontiers will never be duplicated, but undoubtedly has inspired numberless future historians of the region, probably including some in this room as well. Florida has not monopolized Paul's career. He has devoted research and teaching to other settings as well. He has written many works dealing with the Spanish Empire in general, various native peoples of North America, seafaring during the early modern period, and greater Louisiana history. Paul's hundreds of presentations and other accomplishments have earned distinction in a variety of ways. He has received, or he has served in leadership positions for numerous scholarly organizations and received the McGinty Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, Louisiana Historical Association in 2011. <coughs> Paul has received funding to pursue a scholarship from a variety of institutions, including the National Endowment of the Humanities, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Council of Learned Societies, all prestigious entities on an inter international level. Public enthusiasm uh, for his expertise is demonstrated in his multiple television appearances, community lectures, and consultant positions, including his role as a longtime advisor to National Geographic magazine. A public intellectual who unveils to non historians the wonders of the musical past, Paul is a worthy model for other academics in all fields. But Paul always seems to gravitate back to Florida and his past. One of his latest contributions to Florida history came in the form of a special issue he guest edited for the Florida Historical Quarterly titled 500 Years of Florida History, the 16th Century. Assembling some of the best scholarship on the region's early colonial past, he helped provide a new and important collective assessment of the topic echoes of which we will hear tonight. The review of historian scholarship on the region's history he wrote for the issue is so thorough and insightful that students will surely be consulting it for the next 500 years. <laughs> to say the least, to say the least, tonight's talk should prove to be both educational and entertaining for anyone interested in Florida's past. Please join me in welcoming the 2013 Gerald Schaffner Lecturer, Professor Paul E. Hoffman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Dan, for the very generous introduction. I want to 
thank Connie and the Florida Historical Society and University of Central Florida, where my longtime friend Bruce Pauley was a professor, uh, and Phi Alpha Theta chapter here for making this possible. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and a very high honor to be invited to inaugurate what I hope will be a very long running lecture series on Florida's history and quite rightly honors Dr. Schaffner's uh, many contributions to the understanding of that history as well as his editorship of the Florida Historical Quarterly. Now, although I'll talk about the aspects of Spanish Florida's history as a story still largely untold, uh, that observation can be made about many other aspects of the state's rich and varied history. Now, before I get into some, of th some thoughts about the story still largely untold, I want to say a few words about two terms that I'm going to be using tonight. I'll be using the term La Florida to refer to what the Spaniards meant by that term. For them, at its greatest extent, it reached from Cape Cod uh, to the southern end of the peninsula and then west to at least the Mississippi River. Uh, through, although in the 16th century practice, the term La Florida referred to the area from perhaps the entrance to the Delaware Bay, the south end of the peninsula, and then to an unspecified point on the Gulf Coast, probably to the west of St. Mark's. I'll be using Florida, or Peninsular Florida, to refer to what is today the state of Florida. That said, my talk this evening is divided into two parts. Some reflections on the parts of the colonial story that are still largely untold, and a retelling of part of that story in what I hope is a new way. So, La Florida, thoughts about a story still largely untold. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, when I took Florida history in school, that seemed to be, there seemed to be plenty of information about Spanish Florida. And others of you may have read some or all the nine or so chapters on the colonial era uh, in the multi-authored New History of Florida, edited by Dr. Michael Gannon, which has just been re-released as The History of Florida, uh, by the University of Press of Florida. And a few of you may have read the late David Weber's uh, Spain's North American Frontier, which tells the La Florida story along with those of the Spanish Southwest in considerable detail. And perhaps some even of you have read my Florida's Frontiers, and like some of Professor Michael Francis's students when he was up at the University of North Florida, concluded from it that there is nothing more to be said about the Hispanic presence in the peninsula during the roughly three centuries between 1513 and 1521. They were, of course, wrong. In other words, whatever the level of your knowledge of La Florida, you may be questioning my premise, that the story of La Florida is still largely untold. After all, we all know the basic outline. After various Spanish exploratory ventures, St. Augustine was founded for military reasons in 1565. That is, it was founded to prevent the French or the English from using the peninsula's rather poor ports as bases from which to attack Spanish shipping moving through the Bahama Channel. The Franciscan missions along the Georgia coast and then into the interior as far as Appalachia, which is modern Tallahassee, uh, were added in the late 16th and into the 17th centuries and became an additional reason to keep Spanish soldiers and a few settlers in St. Augustine. Lacking gold and silver or evident agricultural possibilities, the colony languished as a small garrison whose mission hinterland was destroyed in 1702 to 1704 by English and Creek grading parties sent from Carolina. In 1763, the rump of La Florida, but then simply Florida, was traded to the British for the return of Havana, and then in 1783, back to Spain at the end of Spain's Second Maritime War with Great Britain, a war fought for the control of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. At the same time, the United States was fighting for its independence in Great Britain. Still anguished, Florida finally passed to the United States in 1821. That's the basic story. Allow me to suggest that the story of La Florida is in fact still largely untold at each of the four scales at which it can be considered or told. These scales are nestled within each other, rather like the Russian nested dolls. The scales are, from the innermost, the inter from the innermost outward, the internal history of the colony, what often passes as the history of Florida, its position in the history of the land area that became the United States, its place in the larger Spanish Empire, and finally its position in the Atlantic world. So let me begin with the innermost of La Florida's uh, innermost scale 
about where it is in journal history. There is no doubt that the knowledge of the internal history of Mount Florida has advanced greatly in the last half century, that is, since the 400th anniversary of the founding of St. Augustine. This will become ever more evident as the special issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly appear over the next several years, each surveying the state of knowledge about particular chronological segments of Mount Florida from the 16th through the 19th centuries. And as you know, I've contributed to the first volume. But Dr. Kathleen Deegan, who is the leading authority on Spanish colonial archaeology, both in La Florida and the larger Caribbean, graciously contributed an essay on the state of archaeological knowledge for the same period. In combination, these essays show a very substantial growth in what we know about the explorers and the Spanish colonies at St. Augustine and Santa Elena, which is on the southeastern tip of Paris Island, just sort of south of modern Beaufort, South Carolina. In combination, historical, that is to say archival, and archaeological research have enriched our understanding of events and the people who lived and died in La Florida during the 16th century. Uh, and no less of a figure than David Ernst Thomas from the American Museum of Natural History says that the combination, the way in which in Florida we talk to each other across that divisional, that uh, disciplinary line, is in his experience almost unique in the history of the United States. So it's something that we do well here in Florida. The same is true with regards to the 17th century missions in life in the late 18th century, St. Augustine. However, of the first 60 years of the late of the, of the 18th century, we remain almost totally ignorant. The period is hardly, has hardly been studied. Yet from all of the advances that have been made in understanding the internal history of La Florida during the 250 years of the first Spanish period, there are at least four broad topics uh, whose history is still largely untold. We know a good deal about how the Spaniards viewed Native Americans, but are only beginning to think about the other side of that coin. How Native Americans may have perceived Spaniards and used their presence to the advantage of Native actors. The Spaniards, and the French and the English as well, all came to a place that was inhabited, and whose variably complex societies had their own ongoing political, social, and economic histories. Two recent studies show that when we reverse our optics, we find that Native Americans in La Florida were sometimes manipulating their uninvited European neighbors not the other way around. Jonathan DeCoster's essay in that special number of the Florida Historical Quarterly shows how Santariwa, the chief of the Tamukwin speakers around the mouth of the St. John's River, drew the French, then the Spaniards, into the web of Indian rivalries and wars. Michael Francis and Kathleen M. Cole have shown that the Wale Rebellion of 1597 that killed most of the Franciscans working in their villages along the Georgia coast may have been part of larger political struggles among the chiefs of that people, struggles in which the Spanish were and remained largely ignorant, even as they recorded things that, read correctly, point to that story. And if I may say so, one of the themes of the early chapters of my Florida's Frontiers is that the Native Americans in the early years of Spanish colonization saw the Spaniards as a new hegemonic people who were expected to act according to Indian norms, in particular by distributing exotic goods to selected great men among the people that the Spaniards thought they were ruling. In fact, there's a wonderful quote from about 1630 uh, where Spanish officials, in great disgust, report that the Indians from Wale had arrived for their annual presence as if for tribute. They were just blown away by the idea. Well, when the Spanish failed to act according to Native American expectations, trouble usually followed. So here is a general topic that still needs more telling, the complex story of Native Americans and Spanish interactions as the Indians may have understood them, which of course is hypothetical because we can't ask them, and they didn't record very much of what they were about. A second general topic in the internal history of La Florida, whose story is still largely untold, is the social history of the Spanish settlements. Dr. Karen Parr's dissertation contains a lot of information on the place and roles of women, soldiers, farmer settlers, and the ruling elite at Santa Elena during most of the 20 or so years that it existed. We have nothing comparable for St. Augustine in the 16th century, and only a bit of this story from later centuries, and that largely due to the work, archaeological work, of Dr. Deegan and her students. Dr. 
James Cusack and Dr. Susan Parker and a few other scholars are beginning to develop this topic for the second Spanish period, which has a rich documentary base. For the first Spanish period, it's sort of like taking the pieces from the jigsaw puzzle where you only have a few, some are documents, some are archaeological, trying to put them together with models or analyses or other ideas from other parts of the Spanish Empire to get an idea of what the picture looks like. And I think perhaps it's impossible to, to sketch that picture in for these little bits of clue that we still have. But it will be difficult for the first Spanish period. A third general story that is largely untold is the internal economic history of Bothell Reader. Now, to be sure, Dr. Eugene Lyon's classic, The Enterprise of Florida, contains extended discussions of how Pedro Menendez de Avales organized the supply of the colony in the years 1565 and 1567. By Florida's frontiers has some of the later history and references to the few detailed studies that I came across while doing that research. Yet, much more can be done. Here, too, the combination of archival and archaeological research can build a story that is still largely untold, even if, I would argue, we understand its broad outlines and some of its surprising contents. An example of the latter is this. The governorship of 17th century Spanish Florida was worth buying. As the story of Governor Benito Ruiz de Salazar by Asia indicates, he acquired the governorship in 1645 in exchange for a finished hull of a 500-ton galleon delivered